big policy changes also ran the day. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts starts us off tonight on the North Lawn. Good evening, John. Brett, good evening to you. No question there was a lot in the president's speech, but there was one curious omission, his support for raising the minimum age to buy a rifle from 18 to 21. The National Rifle Association, a big sponsor of CPAC, is firmly opposed to that idea. But there was one proposal that the president floated that had him in lockstep with his base today. At the Conservative Political Action Conference, President Trump doubled down on his calls for qualified teachers or staff to be armed and trained to respond in the event of a school shooting. Well trained. Gun adept teachers and coaches and people that work in those buildings, people that were in the Marines for 20 years and retired, people in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, people that are adept, adept with weaponry and with guns. President Trump insists that the gun-free zones that describe most American schools are an invitation for killers to pounce, and that the best way to deter school shootings is to let potential killers know if they enter, they will be met with a hail of return fire. It's concealed. So this crazy man who walked in wouldn't even know who it is that has it. That's good. If it's not bad, that's good. And a teacher would have shot the hell out of him before he knew what happened. The proposal was met with derision by Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal, a frequent critic of the president. Half cocked, harebrained, really toxic lunacy is the way to describe the idea of arming 10 to 40 percent of all the teachers in this country. And from the president of the teachers union yesterday, teachers don't want to be armed. We want to teach. No amount of training can prepare an armed teacher to go up against an AR-15. On his way to CPAC, President Trump was also critical of the Broward Sheriff's deputy who stayed outside Douglas High School instead of running toward the unfolding carnage inside. But that's a case where somebody was outside, they're trained, they didn't react properly under pressure or they were cowards. It was a real shot to the police department. Another reason, the president said, to have teachers defend the students because they're far more invested in the children's welfare. These teachers love their students and I'd rather have somebody that loves their students and wants to protect their students than somebody standing outside that doesn't know anybody and doesn't know the students. In addition to school shootings, President Trump today zeroed in on another threat, announcing the biggest package of sanctions yet against North Korea, targeting 27 companies, 28 ships and one individual for smuggling fuel and other supplies to support North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Appearing in the East Room with Australia's Prime Minister, President Trump issued another sharp warning to North Korea. If the sanctions don't work, we'll have to go phase two. And phase two may be a very rough thing may be very, very unfortunate for the world. And with today the day a number of White House staffers were set to lose their interim security clearance, President Trump weighed in on the fact son-in-law Jared Kushner is still operating without his full security clearance. We inherited a system that's broken. It's a broken system. And it shouldn't take this long. So that'll be up to General Kelly. Uh, General Kelly respects Jared a lot. And General Kelly will make that call. I won't make that call. I will let the general who's right here make that call. Sources tell Fox News tonight that the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein telephoned White House Counsel Don McGahn two weeks ago to say that Jared Kushner's security clearance file would not be completed by the deadline today, that there were still some outstanding issues that required further investigation. But we are told tonight from White House officials that Jared Kushner still maintains his interim security clearance. Brett? You know, John, you heard the president saying General Kelly will make that call, the chief of staff. Uh, all the talk about whether General Kelly is staying or going, what is the inside scuttlebutt? Uh, the inside scuttlebutt is that his, his job is safe. Uh, you know, one person told me a while ago, if you're Bill Belichick and you, you have a player who stays out until 4 o'clock in the morning and you bench him, if that player were to be Tom Brady, that player would not get benched. And I'm told that around here, John Kelly is Tom Brady. <laughs> Good analogy. All right, John, thank you.
A passenger vehicle struck a security barrier at the White House this afternoon. The Secret Service tweets the vehicle did not breach the security barrier of the White House complex. It says no shots were fired during that incident, and the female driver of the vehicle was immediately apprehended. Secret Service also saying the woman is someone of record with the service on multiple occasions. Law enforcement sources say she suffers from mental problems. A few minutes ago, President Trump tweeted his thanks to the Secret Service for a job well done. A former campaign aide to President Trump is pleading guilty to conspiracy and tax charges brought by Russia special counsel Robert Mueller. This comes as the former Trump campaign chairman takes another legal hit. Here to straighten it all out, Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge at the D.C. District Court with details. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brett. I was inside the courtroom when Rick Gates pled guilty to two felonies. He seemed remarkably calm throughout until the final minutes when he entered the guilty plea and sealed his fate with the special counsel. Gates pled guilty to conspiracy against the United States, which is a basket of charges, including bank and tax fraud, hiding income from the IRS and failing to register for work on behalf of a pro-Russian party in the Ukraine. The offenses spanned 2006 through 2014, but did not overlap with the Trump campaign. On the second campaign, making a false statement to the FBI, Gates told investigators that a March 2013 meeting between a member of Congress and his boss, former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort, did not include the topic of the Ukraine when Gates didn't know because he wasn't there. Manafort, who was hit with more charges today relating to his lobbying on behalf of the Ukraine, said in a statement, I had hoped and expected my business colleague would have had the strength to continue the battle to prove our innocence. This does not alter my commitment to defend myself against the untrue piled up charges contained in the indictments against me. As he left court today, Gates did not answer reporters' questions about whether he will testify against Manafort. Court records show there is a standard cooperation agreement, but there's no evidence Gates is already helping the special counsel. Gates now becomes the fifth person to plead guilty in the wide-ranging Russia probe, and he's facing several years in federal jail, as well as up to $200,000 in fines, but all of that could be dramatically reduced if there is potential cooperation, Brett. Catherine, thank you. Students, parents, teachers, and community members are asking some hard questions tonight about last week's shooting in South Florida. Those questions come as we learn more about what the Florida House Speaker calls an abject breakdown at all levels. Correspondent Phil Keating has the latest tonight from Parkland, Florida. My laptop was still there, you know, I had ungraded papers that were still there. For the first time since 150 bullets were flying during the Valentine's Day attack, teachers were allowed to return to Stoneman Douglas High to retrieve personal items abandoned in the panic. There was hugging, there was, you know, hugging, there were some tears, there were handshakes, there were glad you're back, glad you're back, you know, I don't know, I had enough hugs to last me, you know, a lifetime today. This as disbelief and disappointment raged nationwide after the revelation that as the shooting was happening, the high school's resource officer ran to the freshman building armed with a gun but never barged inside. That officer, Scott Peterson, a 30-year veteran who was awarded best school resource officer four years ago for his tact and good judgment, according to Broward County Sheriff Scott Israel, had neither when it mattered the most. And so what should he be done? Went in, addressed the killer killed the killer. Another misstep at the scene, officers who thought they were watching a live feed of the shooter instead were watching delayed security footage. The sheriff also has suspended two of his deputies who responded to some of the 20 plus calls for service to deal with a volatile Nicholas Cruz in the past few years. One of those instances involved a claim that Nicholas Cruz planned to shoot up his school. And just months ago, 911 emergency. One of the dispatch calls made by the confessed mass killer himself, this time suggesting he was a victim. Anyone pull a gun or anything on you? No. Okay. They tried to, I kind of got mad and I started punching walls and stuff and then a uh, kid came at me and threw me on the ground. And some of the first responders to the chaotic scene last week came from Coral Springs PD. Speaking for the first time, Officer Jeff Heinrich, who was off duty at the time, rushed in as a cop, as a father of a student, and husband of the school's assistant athletic director. By the grace of God, when they walked down the hallway, they found each other. <laughs> and they were able to shelter in place.
And Florida Republican Governor Rick Scott today unveiling a half billion dollar school safety plan, a three point action plan dealing with modifying gun laws, improving how we deal with mental instability and also addressing school safety. For example, making sure there is at least one armed officer per every thousand students at every school in the state. As for the Stoneman Douglas High School students, they return here on Wednesday, officially getting back to school, getting back to their classrooms to finish off this now forever scarred semester. Brett. That will be tough. Phil Keating live in Parkland, Florida. Phil, thanks. Now back to CPAC in suburban Washington. Conservatives, conservatives gathered across the Potomac in Maryland. They're not only listening to some of their ideological leaders, they're getting hands-on training in activism. Correspondent Peter Ducey reports on grassroots training for the right. Tax cuts. Republicans know they've got a mammoth midterm challenge ahead because 2018 is a do-over for Democrats. We have seen energy on the Democrat side. They thought they were going to win the White House in 2016. They're awake. They're ready uh, to come at these midterms and hopefully take that back the majority. So we have to be just as energized. I expect presidential level turnout in a lot of states. And the president is predicting a problem for his party. So people are sitting there. And they're saying, oh, we just had that great victory. Yeah, let's not vote. Let's go to a movie. We're a, the Republican Party. We're going to do great. And then they end up losing. So you got to keep up the enthusiasm. So CPAC hosted an activist boot camp to share strategy as Senate hopefuls are refining their pitches to keep Republicans interested. Michigan's John James, a veteran and businessman, thinks casting a wide net will help him unseat Senator Debbie Stabenow. I swore an oath to support and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that requires firing up our base without alienating traditional Republicans and making sure that we hold Democrats in the state of Michigan accountable for their misdeeds and neglect. Arizona's Dr. Kelly Ward, running to replace Senator Jeff Flake, plans to highlight her status as an outsider. We, as Republicans, have to give our electorate candidates that inspire them to go to the polls. And Ohio businessman Mike Gibbons, hoping to unseat Senator Sherrod Brown, plans to make his campaign a tribute to Trump. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, where Trump didn't do too well. You throw a rock out a window in Cleveland, chances are you're going to hit a Democrat. Uh, that's not, the rest of the state does not feel that way. Donald Trump would win Ohio by a bigger margin than he took the last time. So President Trump's record is the thing that conservative candidates think will carry them all the way to Washington. And there is not much talk about the group about things they wish President Trump could be doing differently or should be doing differently to help their chances more. Instead, these candidates seem content that what the president has done to date could be enough. Brett? Peter Ducey, live at CPAC. Peter, thanks. A big Friday on Wall Street. The Dow surged 347 and a half. The S&P 500 finished ahead 43. The Nasdaq had a great day, jumping 127. For the week, the Dow was up a third of a percentage point. The S&P 500 gained a half. The Nasdaq shot up one and a third. Just one stock, Amazon today, up $14.66 to close at $1,500. That means for Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, he made a billion dollars. Today, his overall wealth estimated at $124 billion. The president is threatening to pull federal immigration agents out of California. It's the latest threat in his ongoing war with the Golden State over illegal immigration and its sanctuary policy. Correspondent Will Carr tells us more from Los Angeles tonight. We want our cities to be sanctuaries for law-abiding Americans, not for criminals. During his CPAC speech, President Trump lambasted cities and states that he believes protect the interests of illegal immigrants over United States citizens. The laws are just against us. They're against, they're against safety. The comments come on the heels of the president openly questioning if he should pull ICE agents out of California, the blue state that continues to fight the administration at nearly every turn, and one President Trump believes is not doing enough to crack down on the viciously violent MS-13 gang. In California, that if we pull our ICE out, if we ever said, hey, let California alone, let them figure it out for themselves, in two months they'd be begging for us to come back. They would be begging. 
And you know what? I'm thinking about doing it. It's unclear how that policy would be implemented. The San Ysidro Port of Entry near San Diego is the largest in the country and is packed with federal agents. He's clearly sending some messages, not just to California, uh, but also to Congress. So uh, I feel quite certain they'll get it all worked out. That message met with defiance from leaders in California, including Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. Some people are into words. Uh, we're into actions. We're too busy doing work to protect people here on the streets of Los Angeles to, to worry about empty threats. And Senator Dianne Feinstein firing back on Twitter, the president's obsession with California is growing more outrageous by the day. His attacks are not only mean-spirited, they're patently false. Late last month, ICE raided more than 70 businesses in Northern California, the latest example of a stepped-up federal push to enforce immigration laws. President Trump and California have clashed over a variety of other issues as well since he took office, including the border wall, tax reform, marijuana, and offshore drilling. Brett. Will Carr in Los Angeles. Will, thanks. President Trump is also calling on Mexico to block MS-13 gang members from traveling through their country on the way to the U.S. The president says federal agents are removing gang members by the thousands, but he tweets, these killers come back in from El Salvador. President Trump is condemning the continuing assault on Syrian rebels outside Damascus. More killing today, with the death toll for the week now eclipsing 400. Correspondent Benjamin Hall is on the story from our Middle East newsroom. Bombarded relentlessly day and night, in eastern Ghouta, the Syrian civil war is at its peak. At least 426 people, including 98 children, have been killed since Sunday after the Syrian government, backed by Iran and Russia, launched a new offensive. What Russia and what Iran and what Syria have done recently is a humanitarian disgrace. The 400,000 residents of Ghouta have been starved and bombs have struck more than a dozen hospitals. Uh, Bashar Assad is trying to end the situation in Syria by force and this is the only language that he knows. Two days ago, the UN Security Council called for a resolution aiming at a 30-day ceasefire to allow for evacuations of the sick and for convoys of aid to get in. But Russia has repeatedly blocked and delayed, now arguing over the wording. Ghouta lies to the east of Damascus. It's where the sarin gas attack took place in 2013. That was meant to be the red line for President Obama. Now whole families are dying again. I have nowhere to bury my son because of all the airstrikes and rockets. Russian planes have destroyed everything. President Assad's campaign has been celebrated in some parts of Syria and he insists he's attacking terrorists. But as bombs flatten the whole area, few around the world believe him. France's ambassador has also pointed the finger at the UN, saying failure to act now would be the death knell of the United Nations itself. Brett? Benjamin, thank you. The Trump administration is considering a prospective prospective offer from Republican donor Sheldon Adelson to pay for part of the soon to be relocated U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. There are questions about whether that would be permitted or politically wise and how fast it'll happen. Correspondent Rich Edson is here tonight with that. Good evening, Rich. Hey, good evening, Brad. And State Department attorneys are looking into it, whether an American citizen can legally help pay for a United States embassy. A State Department official tells Fox News the government has received no official offer from Sheldon Adelson, and there have been no formal discussions about the donation, though the official refused to rule out informal or unofficial talks or offers between the two. Critics claim a donation from a profoundly pro-Israel Republican donor would allow other politically active groups to follow and inject even more politics into an already sensitive situation. This, as State Department officials say, Secretary Tillerson has just approved a security plan to open the U.S. Embassy in an existing facility in Jerusalem by May, in time for the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel, well ahead of the administration's 2019 target, and fulfilling a presidential campaign promise. It's the right thing to do. We have to do it. And I did it. But every other president really lied because they campaigned on it. That was always a big part of the campaign. Then they got into office. They never did it. 
The official stresses the new U.S. Embassy will only have a footprint in Jerusalem by May, with the target still of opening a larger presence there by the end of 2019. The State Department says initially the interim embassy will have an office for the ambassador and a small staff. Officials say separately the State Department is looking for a site to build a permanent U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, a longer-term project. Brett? Rich, thanks. Up next, a rising star in the Republican Party becomes a shooting star. Perhaps about to crash to earth, we'll explain. First, beyond our borders tonight, parents in Nigeria say more than 100 girls are still missing three days after suspected terrorists attacked their school. The extremist group Boko Haram horrified the world four years ago when it kidnapped almost 300 girls from a boarding school in Nigeria. About 100 of those girls also still remain unaccounted for. Meantime, the Nigerian government insists it has defeated Boko Haram. President Trump's, Trump's eldest son is praising the media in India. Donald Trump Jr. is wrapping up a trip to the Asian country, promoting his family's business interests. Today, he called the Indian media mild and nice. Critics say the family is pushing ethical boundaries with its business dealings during the Trump presidency. And the leaders of the European Union are meeting in Brussels to try to figure out how to make up for a huge budget shortfall when Great Britain leaves the group. That's scheduled to happen in March of next year, remember Brexit. It could cut the EU coffers by about $15 billion a year. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. Calls for his resignation tonight. Missouri Governor Eric Greitens is facing a felony invasion of privacy charge in an already messy narrative about an affair with a St. Louis hairdresser. Senior correspondent Mike Tobin tells us where things stand right now. Republican Eric Greitens of Missouri on Thursday joined the fraternity of governors with mugshots. Greitens insists he is not guilty, rather a victim of a reckless liberal prosecutor. Thank you. The charges against the governor are baseless and unfounded. Uh, Eric is absolutely innocent of these charges and we'll be filing a motion to dismiss very shortly. The indictment goes back to a 2015 affair with a hairdresser before Greitens was a candidate. With her consent, the still unidentified woman was tied to a piece of exercise equipment and blindfolded. But in a conversation recorded by her now ex-husband without her knowledge, the mistress said Greitens took a picture of her, partially nude, and that was without her consent. He stepped back and I saw a flash through the blindfold. You're never going to mention my name, otherwise this picture will be everywhere. The threat would amount to a misdemeanor. However, the circuit attorney said the case fit the felony invasion of privacy no statute because the there picture was, no was transferred to a computer. Was no Greitens was a lieutenant commander in the Navy SEALs, but fellow frogman who spoke to Fox did not vouch for his character. One SEAL wrote, he always had questionable motives and was never considered a member of the SEAL Brotherhood. His agenda was always about himself and not the team. We tried to warn the good people of Missouri, but unfortunately, our voices were not heard. Greitens has not responded to those allegations. The governor has publicly owned up to the affair, but only admitted wrongdoing on a personal level. Greitens says he has no intention of resigning, but Missouri lawmakers are launching an investigation, and even Republicans in the State House are using the word impeachment. Brett. Mike, thank you. <laughs> In tonight's Whatever Happened To segment, the judge, the defendant, and the sentence from a sexual assault case that sparked a major backlash that feeds into today's Me Too movement. Correspondent Claudia Cowan reports from California. Fire Judge Percy! It was the sentence condemned around the world as a slap on the wrist for a privileged white sexual offender at an elite university. In 2016, Judge Aaron Persky gave 18-year-old Stanford freshman and swimmer Brock Turner six months in jail for sexually assaulting a woman who had passed out behind a dumpster near a campus frat party. Observers say the victim personified what later became widely known as the Me Too movement when she read an emotional statement in court hurling venom at her accuser, quote, you have dragged me through this hell with you, and encouraging survivors of sexual assault. 
Your Chief of Staff, General Kelly, has recommended ending the practice of granting interim security clearances to members of the Trump administration. Yeah. If that proceeds, would you be willing to grant a waiver to Jared Kushner, one of your senior advisors? It's a broken system. And it shouldn't take this long. You know how, how many people are on that list. People with not a problem in the world. So that'll be up to General Kelly. Uh, General Kelly respects Jared a lot. And General Kelly will make that call. I won't make that call. It's the Friday lightning round. Uh, the security clearance issue right now, Jared Kushner has an interim clearance. And General Kelly, the chief of staff, had said that's eventually going to